Okay, so our last segment was on subduction zone thermal models and estimates of the thermal structure of different subduction zones as a function primarily of convergence rate and plate age or the thermal parameter phi. This segment, we're going to return a bit to some of the geological aspects and focus on how those thermal structures translate into subduction zone metamorphism. And we'll also discuss a few of the implications of metamorphism on dehydration in subduction environments. So I showed you this diagram in an earlier introductory uh, lecture. It's a fairly generic pressure temperature diagram with metamorphic metamorphic facies and some primary reactions shown on it. And we discussed how subduction zones fall into the metamorphic series known as the high pressure series shown in blue on the right hand diagram, meaning they exhibit a relatively high pressure uh, to temperature ratio compared to other tectonic environments such as orogenic belts, extensional terrains, or magmatic arcs. For this mini lecture, we're going to look in a bit more detail at subduction zone metamorphism and specifically metamorphism of the 5 to 10 kilometer thickness of oceanic crust that occupies the top of the subducting slab and the interface itself. So what I'm showing here now is a more detailed metamorphic facies diagram specifically for rocks of mid-ocean ridge basalt initial composition, so more basalts. And you can see that this has a few extra facies designation on it. Um, they're listed here for your reference, but of course, don't worry about memorizing them or anything. You can always look them up. Also shown on this diagram are the pressure temperature trajectories for some major subduction zones as constrained by thermal models like we discussed in the last lecture module. And you can see that some of the subduction zones plotted would be classified as cold subduction, like New Zealand and Costa Rica, the blue curves on the left, whereas some, whereas some of them would be classified as warm subduction, such as Mexico and uh, Cascadia, the orange and red curves on the right. So there's certainly a variety in the thermal profiles among active subduction zones. So now what I want to do is spend a few minutes walking you through some of these progressive reactions and showing you what some of the metamorphic rocks they produce look like. Note that I'll be showing a whole bunch of mineral names and formulas here, and it may look a little bit overwhelming. But the only thing I really want you to pay attention to is actually the color coding and particularly to the blue colors, which are highlighting the hydrous components in the rock. So here I'm showing a regular, pristine, more basalt. Uh, its mineralogy includes plagioclase, two pyroxenes, and olivine. And note that fundamentally, pure basalt has no hydrous phases in it. However, all basalts become altered on the seafloor, and during the very early stages of metamorphism, they uh, reach the zeolite facies, for example, where hydrous and potassic minerals will come in and start to fill fractures and bugs or vesicles in the rock and thus introduce a significant hydrous component to the original uh, basaltic protolith. So altered basalt then, which most basalts essentially uh, that occupy the seafloor are altered, will contain all sorts of hydrous phases, including clay minerals like smectite and illite, as well as this wide range of uh, zeolite group minerals that form uh, in different PT space. Then as the basalt moves to slightly higher pressure prenite pumpelliite and prenite actinolite facies, the clays remain and the hydrous minerals now include chlorite and prenite and pumpelliite, with pumpelliite being the only one that actually has H2O molecules as opposed to OH. Illite also has those actually. And this is also the conditions where a transition between aragonite and calcite occurs. So aragonite is a higher pressure polymorph of calcite with the same chemical formula, but a different crystal structure. Just some photos of what a fresh pillow basalt compared to an altered and partially subducted uh, basalt at prenite compelliate facies looks like. You can see in the image on the uh, right, much more chloride is present. Uh, the pillow basalts or the pillows of the basalt are sort of faulted and jumbled up and there's lots of veins cutting across it. 
With continued subduction, these altered basalts move into the blue schist facies. Worm subduction zones fall into an epidote blue schist uh, facies, whereas cold subduction zones grow lawsonite and jadeite at higher pressures. Here are some outcrop examples of a lawsonite blue schist from the Franciscan on the left and an epidote blue schist from the cycladic blue schist unit in the Aegean on the right. Both are blue due to the presence of uh, the mineral guacophane. Just a gratuitous thin section photo of a blue schist with uh, beautiful pleochroic guacophane crystals aligned in different orientations. This is just to illustrate how gorgeous these rocks are. They're some of my favorites, so I can't resist. And one thing that's important to note about cold subduction zones and uh, is that the presence of lawsonite. And lawsonite is one of the blue schist facies minerals that stores water both in the forms of OH bonds, but also as H2O uh, molecules. And so if we look back at this plot, the gray colors in the background are showing the amount of water and weight percent that can be stored in particular metamorphic facies. And so you can see that cold subduction zones have the potential to actually store a lot more water uh, than warm ones intuitively, and that storage is primarily in the form of the mineral lawsonite. So these cold subduction zones are the one that can, ones that can really bring uh, water from the Earth's surface uh, to very deep levels of uh, Earth's interior. Finally, with continued subduction, the rocks will enter the eclogite facies. And eclogites can have a wide range of phases that overlap with blue schist and that still contain hydrous minerals such as glaucophane, fengite, uh, lawsonite, and epidote. But pure eclogite contains only omphacite and uh, garnet and is completely dehydrated. So subduction into the pure eclogite facies represents conditions of total dehydration. You've taken the rock and quenched all of the water out of it. Just some of my favorite examples of eclogites. Here's an eclogite lens uh, floating in a blue schist matrix um, on the island of Syros in Greece. And here's another gratuitous thin section for you of an eclogite with beautiful uh, garnets surrounded by omphocyte. This one's also uh, rich in fengite and amphibole. So the take home message from all of that is not the mineral names and formulas themselves, but it's the progressive disappearance of hydrous phases and the associated quenching of the rocks to remove all of the water in their crystal structures. They start out as heavily hydrated on the seafloor, they dehydrate a little during metamorphism to blue schist facies, but still retain water in blue schist facies minerals, especially lawsonite, but also glaucophane, until finally they reach pure eclogite facies and they're completely lost all of their hydrous components. So with that in mind, now we can take our thermal models and try to predict the amount of water that's lost by slabs for subduction zones globally. So this diagram is sort of a classic in geodynamics. It's affectionately named the Tokyo subway map because it looks pretty crazy, like the Tokyo subway system. Uh, but it simply takes the thermal models from uh, the Syracuse thermal models I showed you earlier in the last lecture, and it translates them into slab water loss as a function of depth. And not surprisingly, the slab water loss profiles bear some similarities to the thermal profiles from which they're derived. For example, all slabs show a sharp increase in water loss at a particular depth, and that depth corresponds to the mantle coupling depth or the intersection of the slab with uh, the mantle wedge corner. So the majority of the water loss is occurring where temperatures suddenly go up along the interface due to corner flow uh, in the mantle wedge and the advection of heat that can counteract the advection of cold material plunging downward in the slab. So let's talk a little bit now about some of the consequences of this dehydration profile. So we've already partly discussed one of the most important con consequences, and that is that this dehydration or quenching of water from subducting oceanic crust is precisely what drives arc magmagenesis. And we discussed how typically the volcanic front overlies the depth where the oceanic slab converts to 
eclogite. And that's where it's letting go of most of its mineral bound water. The right hand diagram is showing specifically how water affects the mantle solidus. So the red curve is a typical mantle geotherm for an old, uh, perhaps continental depleted lithospheric plate, something like a craton. And the blue curve is showing uh, the dry solidus. So you can picture how continents away from subduction zones are so dry, therefore they should not have any melting beneath or within them. But as water is added near uh, the dehy dehydrating slab, the blue curve will move toward the left, that is to lower and lower temperatures, and it will become the green curve for just 1% water and the purple curve for uh, much greater than 1% water. And if we come back once more to this diagram, you can see that the amount of water being supplied by the dehydrated slab is well over 1%. It can actually be more than 7% by weight, so easily sufficient to push the mantle into a state of uh, partial melting. Another consequence of dehydration is serpentinization and weakening of the mantle wedge. So the dehydrate, dehydrating slab, of course, plays a role in converting peridotite in the mantle wedge to serpentinite, as shown in the cartoon on the left. The diagram on the right is then showing the consequences of this serpentinization process for viscosity. So you can see here in the lower left plot that the water being released, or you can see the water being released from the top of the slab. This induces serpentinization of part of the mantle wedge corner. That's the red colors shown in this diagram. And then this also reduces the viscosity of the mantle wedge, partly by simply adding water to mantle peridotite. So you now have hydrated peridotite, but especially by converting some of that peridotite uh, to serpentinite, which is notoriously weak. So you can envision that if this occurs throughout the interface, you can end up lubricating the interface quite easily, occupying it or decorating it with uh, uh, sheared serpentinite, uh, just like you would if you were subducting a lot of weak sediments. Another example of a consequence of this metamorphic dehydration process among many is the potential effect it can have on the slab density and associated slab pull. So in this paper, for example, uh, the authors examined the buoyancy of the slab with progressive subduction. So the diagrams on the left are showing density of the slab and surrounding mantle for two time steps, 1.13 MA and 2.26 MA. And you can see how densities change with progressive subduction. So the mantle lithosphere of the slab certainly densifies as it subducts, the brownish red colors that are showing up in the, in the slab uh, subducting slab. The slab crust also densifies, especially where it starts to form eclogite, as in the lower left diagram, the sort of bright red colors at the tip of the slab. You can also see that as fluids rise up into the overlying mantle wedge, its density actually decreases uh, relative to the surrounding dry mantle. The two plots on the right are then showing how these density redistributions due to water release affect the overall slab pull force and uh, the contribution to slab pull from the crust versus the mantle. So the crustal buoyancy is shown in gray on those diagrams. The mantle buoyancy is shown in blue, the slab mantle buoyancy. And the total integrated buoyancy of the slab is shown in red. And the take home message is that in the early stages of subduction, the crust is entirely positively buoyant, so it counteracts, it actually acts against the slab pull force. But as eclogitization starts to occur, the crust becomes negatively buoyant. In fact, it's more uh, dense than the mantle beneath it. And so that will add to slab pull. So you can imagine if you let subduction continue and let the slab go deeper and deeper, you'll eventually offset all of the positive buoyancy of the oceanic crust with the negative buoyancy of the dehydrated eclogite facies oceanic crust, thus leading presumably to uh, faster subduction. So to summarize, uh, subduction zone metamorphism leads to progressive dehydration of oceanic crust, and this uh, releases uh, slab fluids up into the mantle wedge. 
Those fluids are released most vigorously at the mantle coupling depth or the mantle wedge corner. And this is where arc magmas are generated and where substantial weakening of the mantle wedge occurs. Um, metamorphic rocks from subduction zones are very aesthetic. So had to show you some pictures there. In the next uh, segment and the last one on the theme of subduction zones, I'll be talking about subduction zone deformation and uh, seismicity.